was 16 at school, I was told that something I wanted to do was only for stupid girls. Luckily, I had the support of a great teacher who made it, made it happen for me anyway. And that took me on a path of recognising how important it is to be inspired uh, and have great mentors. And I'll tell you a bit more about that story later. I've been lucky to have had five great mentors in my career and life. And they are John Lennon, Tom Hanks, Steve Jobs, William James and Grace Hopper. And I bet you're now thinking, how come she's got such friends in high places? <laughs> well, actually, I've never met them. And they have no idea that they've been my mentors. But it's their words in the form of quotes that have inspired me. So I'm now going to share my five favourite quotes. Hands up who loves a good quote, by the way. Yes, I love a good quote. So I'm now going to share my five favourite quotes with you and explain to you, you know, why they've inspired me. So I'm going to start with the first one from John Lennon. It's, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Now, one of my favourite phrases is, have a direction, don't have a plan. Because if you have a plan, they have a habit of not working out. Whereas if you have a direction, your brain will take you on a path and find ways that you couldn't have imagined possible to get you where you want to be. And this has happened to me a few times um, in my career. And the first one was when I was at university. And we did something, I'm going to show my age here now. Um, who's heard of the milk ground? Do you remember that? It was like a careers fair that you went to. And uh, you know, different companies would encourage you to go and work for them. Well, I was really lucky because I always knew I wanted to be in marketing. Marketing is what I wanted to do. And when you start out, you think the creme de la creme of marketing is in fast-moving consumer goods. And uh, that and a penchant for chocolate took me to the Mars stand. And I said, um, I'm studying German and business studies. Um, I really want to work in marketing, and I'd like to go and work in Germany. And he shook his head and he said, no, you can't do that. I said, why not? And he said, well, first you have to get a job in the UK. He said, you have to earn your stripes, you have to do really well. If you're lucky, you then might apply for a position in Germany. And if it all works out, in extreme cases, you might get a posting to Germany. And I thought, well, that's not working for me. And as it turned out, I got sponsored by a Swiss-German company at university. I got a placement working in their export department in my year off. So while my, my friends were all bumming around at university, I managed to get gainful employment in the export department. And I made some contacts there who were working at Hewlett Packard. So I went back to university for my final year and I graduated. And over the weekend, I moved to Germany and I started work in marketing uh, in Germany with Hewlett Packard. Now, when I had that conversation with the, the person, the man at the, uh, the Mars stand, I had no idea that that was going to be the plan, but it perfectly matched my direction. And it happened again when I was going to do the doctorate. And I was having dinner with a marketing professor who I'd become friends with. We'd been working together. And she said to me, you should do a doctorate in marketing. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. Because in order to get a DBA, which is a Doctor of Business Administration, you have to have an MBA. And I don't want to be bothered with all that other business stuff, operations, finance. Um, what I, you know, I just want to do marketing. And she said to me, well, you don't have to have an MBA to do a DBA. I said, how come? And she said, well, first of all, you need a marketing professor who wants to sp uh, sponsor your area of research. And then you need to do a whole ton of extra exams, but it'll be a breeze. You can do it. And I thought, OK. And I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind. And then I was having a conversation with my boss at the time, who was a great coach. And he said to me, what's your direction? And I said, well, I've always dreamed of being a marketing director. And he said, you are a marketing director. I was like, yes, fair point. I was 31. I thought, I kind of need, an, and he said to me, you need a new direction. So I thought, he's right, I need a new direction. So I thought, what's going to be my direction now? And I thought, well, I absolutely love marketing. I'm going to stay in marketing, but I'm going to be a marketing guru. I'm going to be a world-renowned marketing guru. I thought, how do I get to be a marketing guru? I thought, I know, I'll write a book. And I thought, well, what am I going to write a book about? I need some content. Suddenly, there's the voice, do the doctorate, do the doctorate. And of course, the other voice starts up again. We've overcome the objection that you need an MBA to do a DBA, but now the voice is going, um, now the voice is saying, um, you can't afford it. 
and you get the battle of the voices, which one's going to win? But if the brain has set the direction, it will always find a way, and it's always going to have the stronger voice. And as it turned out, I got headhunted by a firm, and they said to me, what's it going to take to make you come and work for us? And I said, I'd really like to do a doctorate. And they said, come and work for us, you work for a year, and then you can go down to work in three days a week and we'll sponsor the doctorate. Yes! <laughs> so I went back and I said to my boss, I'm terribly sorry, I'm going to resign. And he said, you're not resigning, and we're sitting here until we find out a way to make you stay. He said, do you need more money? And I said, well, money's great, uh, but what I'd really like to do is a doctorate. He said, that's good. He said, we'll fund it. And I'm thinking, stupid me, and that's another piece of advice, is if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> so anyway, in case you'll think it was plain sailing from here, it wasn't. And that brings me to my next quote from Tom Hanks. It's supposed to be hard. If it were easy, everyone could do it. And this got me through my toughest emotional, mental challenge, which was doing my doctorate. You can't imagine how hard it is to sit in front of a blank computer screen knowing that in four years' time, you've got to produce an 80,000-word thesis. And I also didn't imagine how hard it was going to be doing a job that I had been doing in five days a week, suddenly to be able to, having to do it in four days a week, and then studying on a Friday and at weekends. It was relentless. Most people who start a doctorate don't finish them, and I was absolutely determined, I was, absolutely determined I was not going to be one of them. And then something happened. The company that I was working for got acquired by a much bigger company, and they already had a marketing director, and I got made redundant. So faced with the prospect of no job and no sponsorship, it was really tempting to give up on the doctorate, and that's when I hear the voice again. Not of Tom Hanks, but of the quote that's saying, it's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everyone could do it. And I thought, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to get through this. And I thought, what if I could find a way to pay the bills, get a bit of consulting work, use my networking contacts, and go down to working maybe two or three days a week, really enjoy the time doing the doctorate, and accelerate it and finish it in three years instead of four. And that's what I did. And this quote also got me through my toughest physical challenge, which was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. And I was climbing in a group of really long-legged Dutch people, and by the end of the first day, they've completely left me for dust. And I'm sitting there thinking, at the end of the first day, I'm thinking, crikey, I'm not going to make this. And I actually had this thought, it looked really flat in the brochures. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what I was thinking of, because it is a mountain. And um, so I'm thinking, crikey, I'm not going to make this. And luckily, I had a fantastic guide. And he said to me, he said, there's no prizes for coming first. All you have to do is get to the top. He said, you just need to put one foot in front of the other. I thought, OK, I'll go with this. So anyway, the next morning we get up and he said, remember, I'm setting the pace. You follow me, just one foot in front of the other. So off he sets and he's walking like this. And I think he's having a laugh. I thought, we're never going to climb the mountain climbing at this pace. But do you know what? After one hour, we've caught up with the Dutch people who are sitting down taking a break. By lunchtime, we've overtaken them. And, do you know, we were the only two people who got to the top of the mountain in that group that week. And gradually, people fell off because of altitude sickness, because of exhaustion, and because of adverse weather conditions. And actually, the last eight hours was just horrific. We were climbing in, like, minus 20, blizzards. And all I kept thinking of was just put one foot in front of the other. That and singing all kinds of crazy songs in my head, like, ain't no mountain high enough, <laughs> and uh, on eight-hour repeat. But uh, anyway, I got to the top. <coughs> and the point about this piece of advice is most achievement comes from hard work. But often we set ourselves too big a goal, and it's, it just seems unachievable if we think about it in its entirety, either you know, for me doing the doctorate or climbing the mountain. But if you break it down into bite-sized chunks and just put one foot in front of the other, you'll find it's a, an awful lot easier. Of course, it helps if you're passionate about what you do. And that brings me on to my next quote from Steve Jobs. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. You have to love what you do. Life is way too short to do a job that you don't love or to work with people that you don't like. It does absolute wonders for your psyche. And the chief HR officer recently said, you need to have three conditions, oh, that's four, three conditions um, to be successful, to, to really thrive at work. 
She said, you need to feel passionate about what you do, you need to feel safe, and you need to feel that your boss and your co-workers or your team have got your back. And if you don't, it's time to start dreaming again. I don't know how many people have heard of um, Tony Robbins. He's an American motivational speaker and life coach, and he runs these programs. And the boss that I mentioned earlier that was a great coach, he dragged us, I say he did drag us along to this weekend at the Excel Center, 10,000 people. You know, and you get to walk over the hot coals, so you do that in bare feet, you know, the fire walk. I thought I was going to go up in flames, luckily I didn't. But um, he taught me to dream again. You know, he taught me to set a new direction. And I just have to share one bizarre moment. He's, he, Tony Robb is, is trying to teach us to be leaders, and he had us all copying him. And we've got 10,000 people at the Excel Center going, I am a leader, I will not follow. I am a leader, I will not follow. And I'm, I'm standing there thinking, am I the only one getting the irony of this? <laughs> I guess the point is you have to dream again. And you also have to feel that you make a difference. And that brings me on to my next quote from um, William James, who was um, an American philosopher and psychologist in the um, 19th and 20th centuries. And he said, act as if what you do makes a difference. It does. Now, I'm not the classic type of female that does well in a corporate alpha male environment. I'm very softly spoken. You probably can't tell now because I've got a microphone on, a microphone on, but I really struggle to be heard in a noisy room. I'm never going to be that loud, opinionated person who always wants to make sure that their voice is heard. I'm a thinker and a reflector, and I listen well. And when I say something, I like to think that it really counts. I'm also really good at networking, and I'm really good at working with other people and collaborating. And because I don't have a big ego, and I really want to help other people achieve their dreams, then people want to work for me. And I was asked a couple of years ago if I would become the leader of Connected Women at Cisco. And Connected Women is a group of volunteers aimed at acquiring, developing, retaining, and celebrating talented women at Cisco. And when I was first asked to take on this challenge, I, th I said to them, I'm not the classic type of woman that does well at Cisco. You really don't want me leading your network. And they said, that's exactly why we want you leading, your, leading this network. And I couldn't imagine just how much fun I would have um, leading this network over the last couple of the years. I've met the most amazing and inspirational people, men and women. And it's taught me to find my voice in other ways. So I've always been a reader, I've always been a writer. And uh, of course, with the, you know, with the advancement now of social media, I've become quite active on social media. So I've got six and a half thousand followers on Twitter. And I started blogging. And actually now I'm um, a regular contributor to Forbes, to the, um, to the women's section. And it was through that connection as the reason why I'm standing here today, because uh, the team you know, read one of the blogs I'd written on Forbes on, um, on conscious bias. So it's all about knowing your own strengths and playing to them and making that part of your personal brand. So think now about, you know, what are your strengths? How do you make a difference? And how can you make that part of your personal brand? Now, sometimes it does pay to go outside of your comfort zone. And that brings me to my final and favorite quote from Grace Hopper, who was a US Navy admiral. And she said, it's better to beg forgiveness than ask permission. Now, if we go back to what I said at the beginning, when I was at school when I was 16, something I wanted to do was only for stupid girls. It was a typing class. The typing class was only for stupid girls who were doing two A-levels instead of three. Luckily, the teacher who ran the class was also my economics teacher, and I was rather good at economics. And she said to me, we won't ask permission, we'll beg forgiveness when you pass the exam. And actually, the headmistress was so delighted with me delighted with my economics results, she didn't even realize that I'd taken the typing exam. It turned out to be one of the most useful skills I've ever learned, because not only did I get paid work in the local hospital during the school holidays, but I can touch type at speed on a computer keyboard. How useful is that? And this quote has served me well throughout my career, because I'm quite a rule follower. So this one's quite a challenge for me, to not always ask for permission. But in this fast-paced environment, we don't always have the time to stop and ask for permission. Sometimes we just need to get on and do it, take a risk, and then take the consequences. So that's my, my challenge to you, is to do something that you haven't got permission to do. Just take a risk, go on and do it. What's the worst that can happen? And don't quote me on that one. <laughs> So those were my five favorite quotes that have served me really well. Uh, my, so I'm just going to conclude with a reminder of my unconventional career advice. The first one is have a clear direction. 
don't have a plan because your brain has a great way to find a path and take you and to do things that you couldn't possibly have imagined. When things get tough, just take one step at a time. Break things down into bite-sized chunks. Don't try and eat the elephant. You know, just think of that mountain and one step at a time. Third one is love what you do. It's so important. Life is short. Just do something that you're passionate about. <coughs> Believe that you make a difference. Think about the elements that make up your personal brand. Think about what you're good at. Play to your strengths and make it part of your personal brand. And the last one is and I'm challenging you to do this in the next week. Take action now and ask for forgiveness later. Thank you. <laughs>